You know, guys, so those of you who are married, you know, we thought for a while that if you got dressed first, got in the car, and blew the horn, she would magically appear in the seat. Just, ma- it's just magical, you know. And, and you know what it is, and you women are, you, you, know, you, know, you know how you are. When you hear us blowing the horn, what do you do? You just go a little slower so he can learn his lesson well. Amen. But didn't we catch the clue when we were getting, those of you who are married, when you're standing at the altar waiting for her? Amen. You're waiting then, and somebody should tap you on the shoulder and say, dude, get used to it. You're going to be doing that the rest of your life. And we should wait on our wives. We should serve them. Amen. But I don't like, I don't like waiting. But what does the Bible say about waiting? Ecclesiastes 3.11 that he has made everything beautiful in its time. In its time. God has made everything beautiful in its time. And spiritually speaking, when we wait, that's when we actually gain strength. I don't like that, but it's a, it's a spiritual principle. And it's true. As we wait upon the Lord, we gain strength. Isaiah 40, verse 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall Run and not be weary, they shall walk and not faint. Amen. We know that, we quote it all the time, but we still grow weary sometimes waiting. But there's power, there's strength in waiting. See, the devil wants you anxious, he wants you restless, he wants uh, you to give up, because when you're anxious and you're restless, we make foolish decisions. And we give up on trusting God and waiting on God, and we start to rely upon ourselves. The devil wants you to be anxious, but the Bible says, be anxious for nothing but in all things pray. God is not in a hurry. Did you know that? God has perfect timing. And so waiting on the Lord, Caleb, he waited upon the Lord. And notice as he waited upon the Lord, he thrived in the Lord. He did not just survive in the Lord. So important. What did he say? He says right here, he said in verse 13, you know what? Uh, I've been waiting on the Lord all this time. He says, but I I have much vitality in my life, as much vitality as when I was 40 years old. I'm 85 now. I feel like I'm 40. Wow, you want to know what he's drinking, right? 40 years old. And then he says, I'm ready for not the nursing home. I'm not ready for assistant living. I'm ready for war. I'm like, wow, this old dude is something else. Some of us feel like, man, I'm 50 and it's over. My best years are behind me. No, God is still writing your chapter. God is still in control of your life. Amen? Oh, give him praise and glory. He's not finished with you yet. He's not finished with you yet. He's still writing your story. And Caleb said, and he he knew that God was still writing his story because he continued to believe in God. He said, the Lord kept me alive all these years. I love that. Don't overlook that. Verse 10, the Lord kept me alive. If God has kept you alive, he has a purpose for your life. I know we sit and complain sometimes, oh, why am I here? You know, what's my purpose? If, if you're drawing a breath right now, and I know you are, you're watching online, you're breathing, God has a purpose for your life. He's kept you alive for a certain purpose. There's some of us sitting here today and watching online, maybe that you know in your own mind you should be dead, but God kept you alive. And if he kept you alive, he kept you alive for his divine purpose and his divine glory. He's still writing your story. Praise his holy name. And Caleb believed that. And God kept Caleb alive for a promise. What was the promise? In our text, text, the promise was Hebron. A place called Hebron. Hebron means, in Hebrew, it means community. It means alliance. And I thought about that Hebron metaphorically for the church. God has called us to Hebron, if you will. God has given us the promise of Hebron within the church. What is that promise? A promise of community and alliance. That is unity. And when the church is devouring itself and and there's division in the house of the Lord, then for one thing, we are refuting the very prayer request of Jesus. What prayer request was that? Father, make them one as we are one, that the world might believe that you sent the Son. And when the church is divided and devouring each other, we're not Hebron, it's hell. And it's a poor witness to the Lord. God has called us to have community 
and have unity, not just within the church, but also in our marriages, within our families. It's called heaven. So metaphorically, you can say this, God has called all of us as believers to live in heaven, in community, in unity. It's as we wait upon Him that we find this harmony. It's as we trust in Him that we find harmony in our relationships, rather than putting unrealistic demands upon one another, or expecting people to live at a standard that we can't live at ourselves, but to allow the grace of God in us to be administered to other people around us, that we might experience Hebron, community, and unity in Christ. So despite the passage of time, therefore, and his age, Caleb received the promise of God. He received Hebron. He believed God. He was determined to wait on the Lord, on God's timing, that he might possess all that God had promised. The second evidence that I find in Caleb's life that he wholly followed the Lord is not just talk, but it was a part of his life. And that is, he had a heart of devotion. I love what it says in verse 7 as Caleb is sharing how he went and spied out the land, and it was in his heart that God had placed within his heart that, that they could possess the land. It wasn't just a good idea. It was a God idea. It was an idea of possessing the land, the promised land, with 45 years before when he spied out the land. It was in his heart because it was based on the promise of God. In other words, God had given uh, Caleb his word, and Caleb took it to heart. In other words, Caleb was transformed. His faith emboldened because of God's Word. He believed what God said. And sometimes we come to church and we, we, have, we hear the Word of God in our heads, but it's not in our heart. Caleb said, I took it to heart. It was in my heart because God had given me His Word. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due time, due season, we shall reap if we do not lose what? Heart. It's about the heart, is it not? And God looks at the heart. Out of the heart, Jesus said, comes the issues of life. God is concerned about our heart. And he wants to know if our heart is completely devoted to him. Caleb's heart was completely devoted to the Lord based on what God had said. He knew he could trust God. If God said we could take the land, man, we're able to take it because the Lord is with us. Caleb believed God's word because he knew God's reputation. He was there when the Red Sea was split and, and two was divided, and the children of Israel walked across on dry land, and the sea came in on Pharaoh's army and drowned Pharaoh's army. He was there in the wilderness when he saw water coming out of a rock, you know, to, to, to quench the thirst of the, the Israelites. He was there when manna fell from heaven that God fed his people. He saw the pillar of cloud by day that led them, and the pillar of fire by night that led them. He was there when the Jordan River was parted and they crossed over on dry land. He was there when the walls of Jericho fell down. He knew God's reputation. He knew that his God could be trusted. Amen. And what a great lesson for us. Oh, give him praise and glory. Amen. It's a, it's a great reminder for us because some of you are sitting here right now and you're doubting God, you're doubting God. I dare you to look back on his reputation in your life. You would not be here but for the grace of God. It's his faithfulness in your life. And Paul said, even when we're faithless, here's a faithful saying, even when we're faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Amen? And so Caleb understood, oh, it's in my heart. God is faithful. I've seen God do all these things. God did not bring me this far to let me down now. God has not brought you this far to abandon you now. He's a God who is faithful, even when we have been faithless. He remains faithful. Aren't you glad about it? So the next time the enemy comes in and starts casting doubt on God's word, this promises in your life, you say, well, hold on. Amen. Just back up, chump. Amen. <laughs> because let me tell you about my God's reputation. He's been this faithful to me now and brought me this far. He's not going to let me down now.
He's not going to abandon me now. That's a lie from the pit of hell. He says that I'm with you, and I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. That's the promise of God. And I'm here to testify that the promise is true. Amen? Give him praise and glory. He deserves it. Thank God. Well, Caleb was devoted to the Lord. I love what it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. That's the reputation of our God. That's the reputation of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the reputation of, of our God, of our Savior. He who promised is faithful. And so based on God's reputation, <laughs> Caleb holy, was holy, devoted to the Lord. The third evidence that I want to share with you that is evidence of Caleb being holy following the Lord has to do with the fact that there was personal resolve in Caleb's life. Personal resolve, I call it. And I see that here in verse 12. We read along with me here in Joshua 14. It says, verse 12, now therefore, Caleb said, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. I may be able to drive them out as the Lord said, as the Lord promised. Amen. He had personal resolve. And you say, why do you say personal resolve? Because Caleb's mountain was not an easy mountain. He said the Anakim are there. Who are the Anakim? They were giants. Goliath was a descendant of Anak, or the Anakim. They were giants, stout men, big men. As the other ten spies said, we were like grasshoppers on their sight. And then he said, they were down on the giants on my mountain, but they're also fortified places on my mountain. You know, and it's spiritually speaking, it represents the things that we face in our own lives. You have faced giants on your mountain. There's a lot of believers who say they want to follow the Lord, but when they encounter a giant, they want to go the other way. A lot of believers say, I want to follow the Lord, but when you hit that fortified place where the devil says, your mama was this way, your daddy was this way, you're going to be this way, you'll never overcome this in your life. That's what the enemy is telling you. It's a fortified place. It's in your DNA. You're just you're hopeless. That's a lie, because we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Amen? But it's a fortified place, that obstacle. I just can't quit. I just can't stop doing it. That's a fortified place. But Caleb said, with the Lord's help, I'm able to drive them out. Because God is there with me, and God is my strength. He had personal resolve to trust in the Lord, despite the giants and the fortified places that he would face. Again, the, the, the mountain kind of is, is a metaphor for our life, our lot in life, you could say, or where God has us in our life. Some of you see your, your, your family, your family is that mountain or what have you, or your own personal life or challenges or whatever it is. You can apply it to anything, but it's, it's your mountain. In other words, it's, it's, it's your situation. We always want to be on somebody else's mountain, don't we? Look at that. I want to I look like that person. I want to look like that person. I want that mountain that looks like Maui. Amen. It's got the waterfalls, and it's got the lush green, you know, vegetation and all that. Oh, and it's always warm, and it's always nice, and, and it's just there. Oh, and there's a little beach, a little beach, too. Don't forget that. And you go down there, and you dip in the water, and you come back. Oh, I want that mountain. Give me, Lord, give me that mountain. I want her mountain. I want his mountain. I always want what someone else has, but God has given you your mountain. But you've got some challenges on your mountain, don't you? Caleb had some challenges on his mountain, but he, he, it didn't deter him. He continued to say, give me this. God promised me this. I don't care what opposition the devil brings up. God gave me a promise, and God's promise is always greater than the devil's resistance. Give me my mountain. You are who you are. You may not like your mountain. On your mountain, you maybe wish you had more hair. 
Amen. On your mountain, you maybe wish you had a trimmer waist or, or whatever it might be. We we'll always want to be something else. But you are uniquely created in the sight of God. You are uniquely who you are. It is only through who you are that God can magnify his life in a certain manner. He can only do it through you. So be who you are. It's your mountain. Embrace your mountain, your lot in life. And say, God, your promises, you've given me your promises. Give me my mountain. Give me victory over whatever I might be facing. Don't turn and run the other direction. God wants you to have victory over your giants, victory over the fortified places in your life. Caleb believed that. Caleb was determined. He had resolve to say, give me my mountain. I think sometimes we as believers, we don't have resolve because we're not looking for resolve. We don't have spiritual resolve. We think that Christianity is somehow about recreation. There's nothing wrong with recreation. Nothing wrong with enjoying life and all. Yeah, I'm not talking about that. But sometimes we just think that it should all be the mountain of Maui. It should all be easy. It should all be just, just smooth all the time. But there's an old song that my mama used to say, <laughs> old folk saying back in the day, I'm going up on the rough side of the mountain. If the mountain wasn't rough, you couldn't climb it. You couldn't get closer to the Lord. You began to thank God, as I look back on my life, for the rough side. Because the rough side makes you who you are today. The rough side enables you to embrace the promises of God. The rough side, even my wife and I are walking through this right now, it, it, it brings you a place that almost forces you to believe God's Word. When you've got nothing else but God, you're hanging on to God with all you've got. I'm going up. I'm not going back on the rough side of the mountain because you can't, you can't climb glass. Amen. <laughs> but you can climb on the rough side. So you may be going through a rough path. God has made it that way that you might draw closer to Him. But it's your mountain. But you need holy resolve. Romans chapter 8 verse 31 says, What then shall we say to these things? What things? Whatever thing you might be dealing with right now. Amen. Whatever thing you may be going through right now, what do you say to these things? If God, whoo, I love that. If God is for us, who can be against us? Name me somebody. In other words, Paul is saying, name me somebody who can be against us. No weapon formed against us, Isaiah says, will prosper. And every voice that raises up against you, that speaks out against you, God will condemn it. That's the heritage of the saints of God. Aren't you glad about that? Praise His holy name. God is for you. He's not against you. And if God is for you, no one can be against you. And God will make sure as you are climbing your mountain, because He's not going to ask you about your wife's mountain. Hey, Al, how's Norma climbing? Uh, I don't know. She's a little lazy. Whatever. You know, it's not, no. Or he's not going to ask Norma, how's, how's Al's mountain? mountain climbing going. Well, I don't know. He's, you know, he's sitting down on the job, or, and he needs to do more. We, we, you know, he's not going to ask you about someone else's mountain, not the person sitting next to you. He's going to ask you, how are you climbing your mountain? How are you climbing your mountain? Here's what the Bible says. I love this in Psalm 81, verse 10. It says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will Fill it. I think sometimes we come to church, and as a pastor, sometimes I look out at people and I almost see people doing this. You know, like you're trying to feed a child and they don't want to eat the food. I see people spiritually doing this. Mm mm. Mm mm. Mm mm. Mm mm. Mm mm. Mm mm. And you're trying to get the food in the child's mouth. Mm mm. And, and I believe sometimes the Holy Spirit is trying to minister something to somebody. Mm mm. Mm. It can't happen for me. That's not possible for me. I've given up on life. God, you let me down. You're done with me. You've given up on me, Lord. And God is ministering to you His Word. And you're, mm, mm No, open your mouth wide. Open your mouth wide. Dare to trust God. Dare to open your mouth and say, God, fill me. Fill me. 
Amen? Open your mouth wide, and he will fill it. He will fill your heart. He will fill your life with joy, with peace. He's not given us a spirit of fear, but the Bible says, without a power and of love and a sound mind. But you got to open your mouth wide. And you can't just purse your mouth. You can't just, eh, you know. Open it. Ah! Open it wide. What does open and wide mean? Faith, I believe. But God will fill it. Amen. God wants you to be full, to be filled with his promises, filled with his goodness. In conclusion, with a heart wholly yielded to the Lord like that of Caleb, a heart resting in God's timing, a heart devoted to the Lord, a heart that is resolute, that continues to trust and believe God, you yourself in your own life will possess your mountain. You'll be able to possess all that God has ordained for you. Psalm 84, verse 11 and 12 says that no good thing, no good thing. There's a lot of things that I want, but God knows the good things and the bad things. He knows what's the best for me. And he says, no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man or the woman who trusts in you. Trust in the Lord. With all your heart, Scripture says, lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct you, your path on your mountain. Align yourself with this pleasure, my friend, and you will find your purpose. God will show you and direct you, and he will add to your life the things that he has promised to you. And Jesus said it well, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and, and all these other things will be added to you. But seek God first. God will lead you. God will grant you your mountain his promises. Maybe somebody here today that you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've come to church, but you don't know for certain if you were to die today that you'd go to heaven. I want you to know the Bible says that these things are written, the Word of God is written, that you might know that you have everlasting life. You can aimlessly go through this life trying to conquer your own mountain and through success and riches and all these things. But Jesus said, what does it profit a man? To gain the whole world and to lose his soul. Or what can a man give in exchange for a soul? The answer is nothing. The only way that we can truly experience abundant life in him, experience our pleasure or our purpose, is through pleasing God. Because you were created to know him. Jesus is the only path that leads to true life. You say, well, Pastor, I, I want to know that path. I've been trying to climb this mountain. I've been trying to manipulate folks and do all these things and trying to get ahead and all this in my own strength. But I don't have that assurance that, that, I, I'm, that I, I, I am on my way to heaven. I don't, I don't know where my path is leading me. Today you can know by surrendering your life to Christ. You can bow your head right now where you're seated, right now. And then from your heart, because God's looking at your heart, and repeat this prayer after me. Open your heart to God so that you can know his purpose for your life. And you can know that your sins are forgiven and that you're on your way to heaven. By simply praying this prayer, say, Lord Jesus, right there where you're seated. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died for my sins, and I believe you are risen from the dead. Forgive me. Come into my life. I receive you this day as my Lord and as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.